facing any difficulties. And so now I would like to introduce to you Dr. Aviva Ram. Dr. Ram has a medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine, but her first career was as a certified midwife and as an herbalist, certainly an unusual combination. Dr. Ram is the author of a number of professional papers on herbal medicine and several books, including the topic of today's webinar, Vaccinations, A Thoughtful Parent's Guide, and another book called Naturally Healthy Babies and Children. Dr. Ram currently practices integrative medicine and functional medicine at the Ultra Wellness Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. Dr. Ram, it's a delight to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I get to talk about my favorite things. <laughs> well, good. We get to listen about some of our favorite <laughs> things as well. So um, as we get started, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Uh, we all know that vaccines are a great topic of controversy, and it seems like not a week goes by when we don't see some headline, many of them quite scary, about vaccinations. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to have an interest in this topic and give us your own personal perspective on vaccines? Sure. So when I uh, first got interested in the topic of vaccinations was actually when my own children were quite small. In fact, as a mother, you're faced with the choice of whether to vaccinate or sort of presented with the fact that you are going to vaccinate really at the time of your baby's birth. Most babies get a hepatitis B vaccine shortly after birth. My children were actually born at home, so I had a little time to think about it. But um, at the time that my son was born, he's the oldest of my four children, um, and he turned 28 yesterday, so it gives you a perspective on how long ago. Um, the, only whole, the only pertussis vaccine, the whooping cough, which is the P part of the DTaP that we have now, was wholesale pertussis. And many parents who were giving it to their children were noticing that their children were doing things like high-pitched crying or having seizures after the vaccination was administered. This was starting to reach the news, and so as a young, concerned mother, already raising my children somewhat naturally, I didn't want to expose my child to something that potentially could result in neurologic problems. Similarly, at that time, the only polio vaccination that was available was the live polio, and it was established at that time scientifically that the only new polio cases in the United States were coming from people who had had exposure to or children who had been vaccinated with the live polio. So that kind of began my quest to make decisions that were in the best interest of my children. Of course, it was scary to think about not vaccinating, but it was also scary to think about vaccinating. At the same time, I was practicing midwifery, and my clients were having home births, so they had a more natural predilection already. So these same families were then facing many of the same questions that I was facing about vaccinations. Do we, don't we, which ones are safe, how can we protect our kids, who do we trust, what's real, what's not real? And so in order to help answer their questions, I engaged in a full-on kind of mega research project, which became this book, Vaccinations, A Thoughtful Parent's Guide. And my favorite comment when people ask me about the book or when I see little comments running around on Facebook or the Internet is, well, does Dr. Rom believe in vaccinations or not? And the whole point of the book was really to try to provide as unbiased reporting as I possibly could um, so that parents could really make the decision that felt best for and safest for them and most appropriate for their children. So that, that's the answer to how I got involved. Excellent and very interesting. And I think all of us, many of us have been in the same situation of wondering, making decisions right after having given birth to a child, but at the same time don't necessarily have the medical resources to call upon that, that you might have access to. So thank you so much for writing this book. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we move on, if you are able to um, hold the phone up, perhaps just a little closer, we had a couple of folks that said that uh, they're having a little trouble hearing. Yeah, um, other folks are not close to my mouth, but I'll try to bring you oh, a little good. bit closer. Can you hear better? All right, perfect, perfect. Okay, good. Um, and so let's move on and let's start with the pro side. Uh, what are the position of the vaccination proponents? Why vaccinate? Well, just to clarify, even before I answer that question, I am also a vaccination proponent, in the sense that um, vaccinations have been responsible for the decline of not all, but many of our most serious infectious diseases. And 
still now in the developing world where we still see diseases like diphtheria, polio, and other complications of even what might be mild illnesses for our children like chickenpox or measles, vaccinations remain a life-saving option. They really do prevent potentially fatal and sometimes incredibly debilitating diseases. So that is fundamentally the position of vaccination proponents. We need these vaccines to prevent children from developing debilitating or fatal illnesses. I think the problem comes in that um, there's been a fairly unquestioning acceptance of the safety of vaccinations and um, a little bit of ignoring the concerns of parents who worry about what they've heard are some of the side effects or also some of the rumors that might go around about vaccination safety. Excellent. I think another one additional um, position of vaccination proponents to the extreme, but we see this sort of generalized throughout the medical community, is that vaccination is a public health issue. So rather than it being as much of an individual choice as it actually is, the public health and medical community see it as the responsibility of every parent, not only to protect their own children from these illnesses, but to protect society in general with the awareness that the more people that get protected with these vaccinations, the more we have something called herd, as in a herd of horses, herd immunity, which means that once you reach a certain percentage of the population that's been vaccinated, assuming that that vaccine is effective, then that percentage, which is usually around 80% for most vaccines, essentially protects the entire population, so almost 100%, because so few people are actually going to get exposed because the masses are protected. Excellent. Um, you know, there's been a controversy in healthcare as well, uh, even though we're focusing a little bit more on childhood vaccines, but with the flu vaccine, where uh, in certain instances, hospitals and home health care agencies uh, forcing the staff, regardless of their views of vaccination, to get flu shots to protect the patients that are in the hospital. Correct. It's a mandated uh, uh, employment requirement for many health professionals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's switch, let's switch guns here a little bit, and why not vaccinate? What's the position of folks that are against vaccination? So the position of the folks against vac vaccinations are several fold and really kind of run the gamut across what you might see as different philosophical um, values of of families. So fundamental to most families that don't vaccinate, most parents that choose not to vaccinate, is the concern that vaccinations may be harmful and may even do more harm than good in a population of children that are very unlikely to get exposed to certain illnesses. So while parents who choose to, to not vaccinate are often branded as irresponsible, irrational or hysterical or even have been accused of child abuse, it's really not out of irresponsibility or irrationality that parents are questioning. It's out of very real maternal and paternal concern. So that's one kind of overarching um, piece of it. Then you have varying levels of people who have faith-based reasons not to. They may believe um, in a higher spiritual power that will protect their children and so feel like vaccination is mistrust of that higher spiritual power. Uh, you may have people who are very um, committed to a natural organic lifestyle and see vaccinations as just vehicles of toxins and that that would not be consistent with their personal value system. So within the, the choice not to vaccinate, you have various flavors that kind of influence this decision. But for the most part, it is concern that there is inherent harm in vaccination, in the practice of vaccinations. Now, I know the immune system is a terribly complex system and a brilliantly constructed system. So I, uh, at the risk of um, not wanting to occupy the rest of our time together, can you give us a brief overview of how do vaccines actually work? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty simple explanation for what is actually an incredibly nuanced 
biological system, and it's one of my favorite systems to study because it's expanding and changing all the time. But in a nutshell, whenever we are exposed to a foreign material, our body has to decide how it's going to respond. It can respond by recognizing that material as self. It can recognize by completely rejecting that material as something foreign. Or it can do something in between where it doesn't have a full-out massive rejection like somebody would have when they would have an anaphylactic reaction. But it mounts a response against that foreign agent, which is almost always some form of a protein. So when vaccinations are made, the essence of what the vaccination is is usually protein material from a virus or from a bacteria. When that protein enters the bloodstream and goes through the lymph system, the lymphatic system, um, what happens is the body recognizes it as foreign, and that's called an antigen, A-N-T-I-G-E-N, an antigen. And the body responds to that by making something called an antibody. Now, the first time we're exposed to something, we may develop a mild antibody response. What the job of that antibody is, is that it is uniquely primed to recognize that specific antigen. So when, you're, when you encounter it once, your body makes a small amount of antigen. Now, a small amount could be in the hundreds of thousands or millions. Then when you encounter it again, your body responds to it by making even more, anti, more antibody to it. So the principle of the vaccine, and these antibodies will ultimately, um, if you're exposed to the, the actual organism, make a full-on response that protects you from that infection. So that's why vaccinations are usually given in several doses over a period of time. You get your first response, which kind of primes the pump. You get your second response, which builds up even more antibody. And then sometimes for these vaccines, we get even third or fourth or maybe even a booster 10 years later because sometimes these antibodies start to deplete in numbers and we need to prime that pump again. That is really basically how vaccinations work. It's just a little bit of a substance that's designed to alert our body it's almost like um, it reminds me of the kind of philosophy behind the canine dogs. You know, the canine dogs are taught to recognize the scent of something by being exposed to that scent and exposed to that scent. So when they go to the airport and they really are exposed to it in a big way, they can sniff it out and start barking right away. And that's basically the job of the immune system is to recognize and respond. Excellent. So when we look at um, the fact that we now have a basic understanding of how vaccines work, how well do vaccines work? Every vaccine works with a little bit different efficacy. It has long been believed that most vaccines provide immunity for a lifetime, with the exception of, for example, tetanus, which we have long known needs a booster approximately every 10 years to keep the system really responsive to the tetanus organism. About 10 years ago, it was recognized that the rubella vaccine didn't actually last as long as we thought it lasted. And so uh, a new program was instituted to start giving kids rubella vaccine, which is the German measles, as a booster when they reached middle school years, because by about that time it started to what we call wane or waning immunity. And then women uh, were sometimes encouraged to get a booster prior to becoming pregnant because you can't get it uh, when you're pregnant. It's not safe for the baby. But until recently, we actually thought that most of the vaccines worked most of the time. About 80% is usually um, the given um, efficacy of vaccines. But as we have seen this past year with both the flu vaccine which ended up having an efficacy rate of about 54% in the general population. Um, and we know with the new pertussis vaccine that's been out, um, last year we saw a significant number of very large pertussis outbreaks, and initially, which is whooping cough, initially those were sort of blamed on families that didn't vaccinate, but with further investigation, it was actually identified that about 50% of all the kids that developed pertussis did so and had been vaccinated. So then further investigation led to um, 
CDC and, and individual um, researchers looking at the actual efficacy of the vaccine, and what they found that it was probably about 50 to 60 percent effective, and that after about two years, about 50 percent of the immunity was gone. So by about four years, you were not protected by the vaccination anymore. So this is probably going to lead to some rethinking of that vaccination um, and, and what needs to be done to make it more effective. So, you know, we're just kind of discovering these things, but these vaccines have been used for years, so we don't know what's going to be next that we find out that may be less effective than we thought. You know, um, and this may be folk wisdom. I don't know if there's any scientific basis for this, but it's long been said in the natural health community that having the disease is actually so much more protective than the vaccinations. For example, that individuals, while it's miserable, a healthy a strong individual who has a miserable case of the flu actually has better flu immunity for years to come, even though the virus mutates each year, than individuals who get flu vaccine. Is there any truth to that? Well, that hasn't necessarily been demonstrated across the board with the flu, but it has been known that it is known that people who develop, uh, who get measles, for example, as a child, or mumps as a child, are protected with lifelong immunity from these illnesses. The problem is um, several fold. Um, one is that you never really know whose immune system is operating at optimal at any given time or really how somebody's going to respond. And even simple things like a high sugar diet for children does actually diminish their immune response quite a bit. Then you add to that you know, the growing number of kids with allergies and asthma and other illnesses that let us know that kids' immune systems aren't really functioning at the level that, for example, our grandparents' immune systems might have been when they were children. So the capacity to deal with these illnesses now may be different than it was 100 years ago. But ultimately, ideally, yes, we would be exposed to these illnesses at the ages that would be typical. So, for example, um, in the, in, historically, had the measles. And she became pregnant. She had natural measles from getting the illness as a child. And then she became pregnant. Her baby would actually get maternal um, vertical transmission of that immunity. It would be passed down to the baby. So the baby would actually be protected from this in the first couple of years of life when measles infection tends to be a little bit more serious. Then historically, kids would have typically gotten the measles more around the ages of 4 to 10 years old then they would have lifelong immunity and wouldn't be likely to get the measles again when they were teenagers or adults when it can have very serious um, neurologic consequences. What's happened with vaccinations is that we protect kids when they're really young and they're sort of the least vulnerable to the worst effects of these illnesses for some of them. And then they may have waning immunity when they're older and then get exposed to certain diseases when they're older when they can have more consequences. So it's complicated. Um, we call that shifting disease epidemiology, where you shift the age that people would have historically gotten a disease to a different age when they may be more vulnerable to it. Mm -hmm. Well, now that we've talked... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish your thought. If, if um, women are getting vaccinated and not having the natural illnesses, then their babies are not protected, and so then they're also vulnerable in that kind of zero to two-year range. Uh, so then they also become more vulnerable to these pretty si significant potential consequences of these illnesses. Well, that brings us up to our uh, next slide, which is the CDC recommended immunizations as of 2013. And my, uh, my oldest child has children of his own, uh, and I can tell you for sure that his vaccination uh, or his immunization schedule looked nothing like this when he was a child. So obviously there's been a dramatic increase in the number of recommended vaccinations. It's kind of a full dance card, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yes, we have many more vaccinations than we did. Uh, when I was a kid, I think I got um, German measles, polio. I remember taking that little liquid polio juice, um, which was the live polio. I mean, there were just a handful of vaccinations that we got at that time, and now kids get over 20 vaccines. 
over 20 individual shots by the time they're 18 months old. So it's pretty significant. They typically get anywhere from three to five vaccinations in one visit, and some of those individual shots typically may have one, two, or three different microorganisms represented in them. So, for example, the measles, mumps, rubella, which is the MMR, has three things in it, or the DTaP has three things in it. So if they get those at the same visit, that's actually six different infections that they're exposed to at once. And this is one of the things that parents are concerned about. Basically, one of the arguments is that if you went out even to the worst, most infected developing part of the world, it's extremely unlikely that you will get exposed to measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus all in one day. And so many parents feel that that's an overload and an insult to kids' immune systems. And, in fact, it may well be. We really don't know for sure that it's not. Well, and as you said earlier, there's a, there's a great deal of difference between generations of based with diets and lifestyle regarding immune response anyway, and I'm sure that there's a huge amount of variety just betwixt individuals of the same generation. So while some children may be able to handle this tremendous request of the immune system to create antibodies in 17 different directions at one time, other children might be particularly challenged by this, mightn't they? I, I agree. And when I, you know, many parents ask me about measles, mumps, rubella, and autism, and do I think the vaccinations cause autism, you know, I think that there are really two things happening. I don't think that any single vaccine by itself necessarily causes autism. I, I really don't believe that. What I do believe is that by the time kids are born, we know from research that's been done by the Environmental Working Group and promoted by the Institute of Medicine even, that kids are born with a toxic body burden of environmental chemicals of over 300 chemicals that we can identify just in the umbilical cord. So we have a lot of things that are new to nature, as I call them, things that we did not genetically or biologically evolve to deal with in our bodies. So we have that going on, and then we have kids who are having a very different immunologic response than human beings had 100 years ago because we're exposed to antibiotics at young ages and these affect the gut flora. So we know that kids who get an antibiotic for an ear infection under the age of six months are actually more susceptible to developing allergies, asthma, and even inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or an ulcerative colitis. So something's going on in kids' immune systems that's different now than it was even 30 years ago or certainly 50 or 100 years ago. And, you know, this, it, there are complex factors that kind of are uh, gestalt that probably make certain kids, when you add all those factors together, as you say, more vulnerable than possibly the next child. Mm -hmm. That may be why it's so hard to get to the root of true vaccination risk is because there's really a lot of factors that come into play whether, which puts us at the point of whether the vaccination is the tipping point for the child. Exactly, and I typically think that is really what it is, that it's the tipping point as opposed to the sole factor in the entire picture. Um, really, in the past few years, we know that the autism rate has doubled. It's gone from uh, 1 in 150 to 1 in 80 kids now considered on the autistic spectrum, and that's a hundredfold over what it was 30 years ago or more. Um, but the vaccine schedule hasn't really changed that much in the past few years, it's not enough to tip that kind of doubling of a neurologic consequence. So there, there's certainly something going on that's more than just this, although this may contribute. I can't say that it doesn't. Well, then I think that leads us to vaccination risks. Can you give us uh, some idea of what you're most concerned about with vaccination risks? Well, historically right now is probably the safest time in many ways for people to vaccinate their children in the sense that almost all of the vaccines no longer contain that mercury derivative called thimerosal. The only vaccine that still contains that is actually the flu vaccine. So, and we have switched largely to vaccines that have lower uh, triggering of neurologic consequences than we even saw 25 years ago. My biggest concern about vaccinations isn't so much for the acute reactions. Commonly, kids will, in fact, develop a fever or be a little bit um, 
tired or irritable or cry more after a vaccination. And certainly there may be some irritability going on in the nervous system as a result of it, because they don't do that after a regular doctor's office visit. So it's not just the stress of a doctor's office visit. My concern is more what are the long-term immunologic consequences that we have that we have that we have as a result of not getting the benefit for those who would actually come through these common childhood illnesses well and what that might have provided to the immune system in terms of strengthening the immune system that kids don't get now. So what I wonder isn't so much, I don't worry so much about kids um, having immediate consequences, although those are certainly possible, I worry about what's happening to the long-term immune system. Why are we seeing so many autoimmune diseases now really in the generation of people that are becoming adults who would have been that sort of first and second wave and now into um, third wave of, of um, population that would have received more vaccinations? Why are we seeing autoimmune conditions in kids at younger ages? These are the things that concern me. However, I do tell parents, if your baby has a fever, if your baby has a cold, if your baby is just not quite his or herself, go ahead and don't vaccinate at that visit. Go ahead and postpone your, vi your pediatric visit, your family doctor visit, until your child is completely well, just to really optimize their immune system and their health and mitigate any potential risks whatsoever. I was talking with an... Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, when you were talking about the immune system, I have a, a I was talking with an integrative medical practitioner who uh, said that the, who described it, that the immune system is designed to keep busy because our bodies, our, our human uh, bodies over the millennia have been exposed to such a tremendous amount of infective organisms, regardless of what the causative agent is, whether it's a fungus or whether it's a virus or whatever, or bacteria, or whatever it might be that in fact in the history of our human life on this planet, we've been infected more than we have not been infected. And so by taking away th that level of infection, now we have an immune system with time on its hands. And it's, it's, and it's designed to, to keep busy. Yes, yeah. it's a great way to put it. And there is a very well-known phenomenon that children who grow up in um, developing countries where parasites, intestinal parasites, for example, are rampant, the immune system is busy dealing with those parasites. And so in those populations, kids almost or, or very rarely have allergies or asthma. The, those populations have a very low rate of autoimmune conditions. That said, there's the trade-off. You know, the trade-off is in those countries, people die of measles every day. So, you know, I, in fact, when I was in Haiti last, last year for a month, I spent a month doing medical care down there. I actually encountered a patient on the street. She was um, very septic, and I, t I brought her into the emergency tent and took care of her, and it turned out that she had a fulminant case of diphtheria. So had I not been vaccinated, um, that would have been an exposure that I had, and it could have been serious. I'm sure this woman did not live. We transferred her to a, a, a higher level hospital, but I, I don't think she would have survived the severity of the illness she had. So, you know, we're trading off on some level or possibly trading off autoimmune conditions for prevention of what, what could be but may not be at, uh, for most of the population serious illnesses. It's complicated. So it is, isn't it? Um, it is. So with that said, do you think that there's a middle ground? I think what there is, yes, I do believe there's a middle ground. I, I think that it's a balance between um, personal choice and public health. I think that it's um, possible for us to reduce the number of vaccinations that children, and when I'm talking about this, when I'm having this conversation with you right now, I'm talking about children in the United States. I'm not talking about children in, Cong in the Congo or in Haiti. I'm really very much talking about kids in our country or and possibly in Western European countries where there's good nutrition and access to medical care. I do think that it's reasonable to forego some of the vaccinations that we have or certainly delay them until later uh, and make individual assessments on children's potential for exposure. So, for example, 
very few children in the United States get seriously or terminally ill from the chicken pox. It's an illness that until 15 years ago most kids got, did fine, um, and a small percentage of kids really did end up quite sick or even died from it. But in, in most cases those are children who are either immunocompromised or malnourished. So you know, vaccinating millions of kids to protect several thousand kids rather than um, ensuring the nutrition and health care of those several thousand kids may not be the most practical way to go about things, in, in my personal opinion. Um, and there are several vaccines that probably fit into that category, like the rotavirus, which for most kids it's an unpleasant diarrheal disease, but we vaccinate all kids for it. Well, with the chickenpox, wasn't there the added element of we encouraged and forced many kids to get this vaccine and made it difficult to go to school unless you complied with that schedule? Then all these children were vaccinated for chickenpox, and very soon thereafter they found that it was really not an enduring immunity and that what we were doing was protecting children until they got into their teen years so that they could check, catch chickenpox when they would really have potentially severe consequences. That does definitely happen with a variety of illnesses. Um, Chickenpox has had a fairly long immunity, but that definitely has happened with, for example, the German with rubella. Um, we do see with chickenpox um, that kids are not getting the illness, and um, I've seen some pretty desperate attempts of parents to get give their kids the illness when they're choosing <laughs> not to vaccinate, like lollipop parties where people are sending yes, I've, lollipops I've heard of across those. the country. And I don't yes. endorse that either. I don't think that's a good idea. I think Absolutely. I actually might prefer the vaccine over some spit from some unknown place. <laughs> <laughs> well, that said, no ground, and I think what's even more important is that um, there has been really such a divided um, political milieu around the vaccinations issue. And when I wrote my book, The Vaccinations: A Thoughtful Parents Guide, and I wrote it as neutrally as I could, it was because there were such divided camps. And on the one hand, you had the medical community basically saying, sometimes quite literally to parents, if you don't vaccinate, your kid is going to die. But then on the other hand, we had a really highly reactive population of anti-vaccine parents telling parents, if you do vaccinate, your kid is going to die. And really, it's, it's true, true, and unrelated. Do you know what I mean? It either could happen or none could happen. And so we're the middle ground to me that's most important is a meaningful conversation, that parents who choose to vaccinate with an alternative schedule, as I know we're going to get to, or parents uh -huh. who choose to forego some vaccines over other vaccines, or maybe who even choose not to vaccinate, are not ostracized from medical care. There are pediatricians who, in spite of the American Academy of Pediatrics saying that even unvaccinated children should be entitled to equal medical care, there are pediatric and family medicine practices that will not see children or will kick children out if the parents choose not to vaccinate. Um, on the other hand, there are parents who have chosen not to vaccinate who are so afraid to enter into the medical system that when their children might get more sick and actually need medical care, are afraid to enter the system for fear of sort of being found out. So we have to be able to have the, a more kind of sensible, rational conversation where everybody's listening to everybody and there's tolerance for making appropriate decisions. I do find that that receptivity for, with me as a physician, parents knowing that I'm opening to, open to the conversation, really helps support them in making the decisions that they feel most comfortable with. And, and my experience is that a lot of parents do want to do a few of the vaccines and will often opt to do the ones that present the most serious illnesses to their kids and then may forego others or delay others. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to this slide, which is um, an excerpt from Dr. Sears' book, the vaccine book, alternative schedules, instead of lumping so many vaccines into one place but uh, spreading them out more equally. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so when, when we been, look at oh, this, yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering, looking at this list, if if you only could select two or three, which do you think are the most important vaccines for children to receive? Well, for children under two years old, the Hib, which is the Haemophilus Haemophilus influenza B vaccine, 
has had a fairly low rate of adverse effects and does protect children quite effectively against an infection that can cause meningitis. And we've seen the meningitis rate in children go down about uh, 80% since the introduction of this vaccination. So one parent asked me, you know, what would you do for kids under two? I really don't want to do everything. That is one of the more important uh, vaccinations that I would recommend because it is a potentially, although it's rare and usually just ends up with a head cold, it, it is a potentially life-threatening um, disease. So that's one. Um, the other illness that can negatively or harmfully affect children under the age of two years is the pertussis. And there have been a lot of outbreaks of pertussis, but really the pertussis comes in a package of diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. So that's the DTaP, and the AP means acellular pertussis. So when parents don't want to choose that one because they're concerned about the side effects of the vaccination, what I do tell them is that if there's pertussis going around and you have a child under two, consider getting the vaccination at the start of the outbreak or if there's pertussis in your community, consider giving your baby an antibiotic at the first sign of any illness just to help mitigate the severity of the disease. The other vaccination that I will often recommend to parents is the tetanus vaccine. Many of the parents who choose not to vaccinate are uh, more natural. They like their kids to play outside. In fact, just about a week ago, I got a, a, a Facebook message from a mother who I, who I didn't know but follows me on Facebook, saying my 18-month-old was playing outside, working in the compost pile with me on the, gar in the, on the farm, and then got cut on something. And what do I do? And for kids who are going to be playing outside all the time, I mean, the chance of anyone getting tetanus is extremely small, but it is over 50% fatal, and it's just a horrible, horrible disease that nobody should get. Um, and so for parents who are going to be worried all the time because their kids are playing outside, you know, we have to take into consideration the emotional factors that come to play, and you don't want your kids to be worried about playing, and we don't want to be worried about playing and making them neurotic and crazy every time they get a cut. So the tetanus vaccine itself is fairly low risk. The risk really comes with repeated exposure. So people like veterinarians or military personnel who get, who get boosters every 10 years their whole life, maybe in their 60s, they may have a reaction for it, but, to it. But it's a very low reactivity vaccine. And so sometimes I'll say to parents, that's an important one. Then if parents are taking their kids on, uh, to, on international travel, that kind of opens up a whole different conversation. All right, a um, little bit about school and daycare advice. Um, we all know that there is a oh, tremendous pressure. Do you, do you mind if I oh, interrupt sure. you and we just jump back to the previous for one minute? Yes. You know, one thing I do want parents to be aware of, or two things for parents to be aware of, if they're going to do this alternative type of vaccination schedule, is two things. One, there's no evidence that um, it actually reduces the um, – reactivity of any of the individual vaccines, but also if you look at the schedule compared to the other schedule, your kids are having a lot of doctor's office visits and a lot of shots this way. You know, it's, it's a lot of visits much more frequently. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're making your decision. I'm totally supportive of any way that parents want to do it, but that's just one of the um, disadvantages of the schedule. Okay, sorry. So, uh, no, no, good points, good points. Because, you know, what I really appreciate is your attempt to pre present the pros and cons from both sides of the equation. And so, which brings us to school and daycare advice. We all mm -hmm. know that there's tremendous pressure to have um, the dance card completely filled when it comes to vaccinations for children entering daycare and school. And so what advice would you give to parents who have chosen to either not vaccinate or to um, reduce their immunization schedule so perhaps they're not getting as many vaccinations or not on the same time period. Uh, is right. it a, you know, are there ways that you can uh, still send your child to school and daycare with, with having the, the strong beliefs about not vaccinating? Yeah, so the big issue with daycare is keep in mind that kids in daycare are young kids. They're little. They're, you know, they're between babies and a couple, a few years old. So and kids in daycare are much more um, exposed to other kids' infectious diseases. 
So if you're going to put your child in, in daycare and your child is not vaccinated, you do need to be prepared for the fact that their, your child's going to likely get sick more often. So things like the flu are going to be circulating around, and you'll have to just make a decision on how to respond and make sure that you're prepared should your child get one of these illnesses like pertussis or, or influenza. Um, every state and every institution, whether public or private, has different um, uh, re regulations or requirements. So, for example, in, in some states, um, you can get vaccination in exemptions based on philosophical principles. So you can be just a kind of an alternative-minded parent. Say you have, um, it's in your, your philosophical exemption is that you just don't believe in vaccinations or you do everything natural or whatever it is. You write that, you send it in on a piece of paper, and you're exempt. Some states will not accept philosophical rec um, exemptions, and they will only accept medical exemptions or sometimes medical and religious exemptions. Now, a lot of parents, even if they're not part of a religious group, will be able to claim a, a religious exemption. In some places, they're not that strict, but in some states, you will be, re you will be required to demonstrate that you're part of a religious, religious affiliation. A medical exemption uh, is the most difficult to get, and some states are requiring that you actually have a medical exemption to um, send your kid to public school. A private school doesn't have to follow the state regulations. If it's private, they can just say, look, we're not accepting this. Your kid has to be vaccinated to come here, um, although they tend to be a little bit more liberal and tolerant. Um, but with the medical exemption, typically it's a form that requires you to demonstrate through having a physician, your child's physician, document that there was actually there is actually a legitimate medical reason that your child can't be vaccinated. So your child has had a not just a, a fever or a fussiness after a prior vaccine, but a seizure or an, an event that constitutes one of these medical events, or your child has a disease like um, HIV or leukemia that prevents them from getting a vaccination because they're immunocompromised. My uh, my sense is that it's as more and more parents choose not to vaccinate, it's going to become increasingly difficult to get these exemptions because it's going to be really the only way that states can crack down on on um, the, the decreasing vaccination rate. But it can be done. Um, all of my kids went to college, and my children, as I said, were born during the era. Um, my youngest is 19, so it was really before the change in vaccinations that um, we have now that have thimerosal free, the acellular pertussis, and the dead polio. Um, so my children had not been vaccinated by the time they went to college, and we had no problem doing the exemptions, and they all were all able to matriculate without a problem. When my son went to medical school, he did, in fact, need to get vaccinated, and then at one point, one of my children was um, planning a trip to rural central Mexico and did get vaccinated. Um, so, you know, it really is going to depend on, or one of my children, um, she wanted to work at a, um, a summer camp where they have medically ill and immunocompromised kids and they required her to be vaccinated and they do have that right. It was a private, um, private operation. And so she had to make a decision what to do about that. That brings us to a nice segue into uh, advice for international travel. Um, so another area that's really difficult to navigate are the vaccinations that are related to international travel. What do you advise parents of children who are going to be going abroad if they don't have the complete vaccination schedule or, uh, or if they're following an alternative schedule or have chosen not to vaccinate? Sure. So three things are important. One is to... Um, identify what of the vaccine preventable illnesses that we have in the United States that your child is not vaccinated for and wouldn't be likely to be exposed to that may be active where you're going. So for example, the diphtheria I saw in Haiti, or if your child is not vaccinated against polio, but you're going to an endemic area, you have to make a decision whether you're gonna let your child be subjected to the potential for getting paralytic polio that's a, you know, it seems like a no-brainer, but for some parents, it's a really difficult decision. That brings me to the second point, which is that some vaccinations take months to build up immunity, or you may need two or three shots 
before you become immune. So I have literally had parents show up at my medical practice saying, my child is not vaccinated for X, Y, and Z. We're leaving for Sierra Leone next Monday, you know, five days from now. Um, Can you vaccinate him or her? And I'm looking at them saying, this vaccine is going to be a series of three, and it's going to take six months before your kid is immune so, if, you know, effectively your child is not going to be immune. And um, so then it gets complicated. So plan ahead. Think a year or six months ahead to what your child might need and make sure you're getting that if you do decide that you want those vaccinations for travel. Which brings me to the third point, which is that there are illnesses that may be encountered abroad that would not be encountered here that you can find out about by going to the CDC website. Just go to the Centers for Disease Control Vaccination or Travel Vaccine. You can put that in your search. It will pull up this section of the CDC, which is easy to navigate. You can search by country, and it will tell you, you know, if you're in the city, you're in the mountains, you're in the rural area, these are the illnesses that are happening at this time of year. Um, sometimes, il- uh, sometimes vaccinations are required for international travel. So I've had families email me and literally say, would you write a vaccine letter? We're going to uh, Rwanda next week, and yellow fever is required, and we don't want to give it to our child. And I try to, as politely as possible, say, you will be stopped at customs in Rwanda, and you will not be allowed to enter the country. <laughs> you will be sent home. So sometimes you have to just make a decision based on what the, what the very bottom line legal issue is. One thing that I I also think is very important for parents to consider is that if your child develops the measles here in the United States and it's a complicated case, you can go to any emergency room and you can end up in any hospital that's going to be well equipped to provide medical care that your child needs. That is not the same if you're traveling to a developing country. You will not necessarily have adequate care. You might not even have oxygen and IV fluids if your children need them, or you might not have the appropriate antibiotic or even clean syringes for administering an antibiotic. So, you know, if they needed it um, intramuscularly or IV. So parents need to think about the whole picture. If you choose not to vaccinate and you go to a country and your child gets one of these illnesses, how well equipped will that uh, medical community be um, be to treat your child. So that's another kind of nuance of it that I encourage parents to think about. Excellent. Um, we also uh, wanted to spend a few moments on uh, making an informed decision. Helping, here's some talking points about um, how to make an informed decision about vaccinations. Mm-hmm. And of course, first and foremost is how dangerous is the disease against which I'm vaccinating? Is it polio or is it chickenpox? Correct. And yeah, I think and we've that's already. The first, that's the first question I always encourage parents to ask themselves. Um, because obviously, if your child were to contract chicken pox and have a bad case of it, you're probably not going to beat yourself up for the rest of your life over it. Because kids get chicken pox and most kids get through it. But if your kid got hip meningitis and ended up with some horrible neurologic consequence, you know, you may feel differently. So how severe is the illness is a really important question. And then that brings us to the next question you have here. Um, Cheryl, if you want to. What's what's the likelihood of my child contracting the disease if I don't vaccinate and if I do vaccinate? So it comes back down to likelihood. It comes back to likelihood and how effective is the vaccine. So you may have concerns about the pertussis vaccine. Um, It may be actually quite likely that your child would get exposed but your child may only get 50% protection from the vaccination. They may actually have a a milder case because they were vaccinated, but that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. This third one is one that's that's, uh, difficult for me. What are the risks of the vaccine and how likely are these to occur? Because the common person out there with kids and uh, working in, in jobs outside the medical field how are they supposed to know what the risks of the vaccine are and how likely they are to occur? I guess one resource would be to read your book. I suppose there's some online resources, but but how do it's people tough, know? Though. You know, yeah. I think that we don't really know. Um, you know, I'm a physician who wrote a vaccinations book, and I really find it difficult to track down accurate data on 
the adverse effects of vaccinations, partly because when um, when they're reported to um, disease to um, to reaction um, databases, doctors tend to dismiss adverse events sort of temporarily associated with vaccines as adverse vaccine reactions. So my sense is that they're grossly underreported. We don't actually know how likely they are to, to occur. They occur, the severity of them that occurs now is certainly less than it was 15 years ago. You know, I can tell you as a family physician who has administered vaccines to my patients that many, many, many kids, if not 75% or more, do have some reaction. They may get a little redness and irritation at the vaccination site. They get um, fussy. They may want to sleep. They may cry more. Um, but we're not seeing a lot of kids coming back with seizures or um, any kind of major neurologic consequences. But, but I have had many parents come to me and say, my child was fine. And I'm talking, you know, conservative parents, not alternative parents, not from any specific religious belief system that might be extreme or, you know, distance from the medical community. I'm talking about kind of Wall Street analyst parents who were doing everything normally with their kids and following the vaccination schedule who come to me and say, my kid was fine until that vaccination um, series at 15 months, and now my kid has lost all expressive speech and all receptive speech and is on the autistic spectrum. So physicians hear these stories all the time. You see these stories in the media all the time, but those stories are almost always dismissed by the medical community as having any relationship to the vaccination. So that's where the data starts to fall thin. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know you do have some suggestions for reducing vaccine reactions. Yeah, the biggest and most important thing that I recommend is to um, make sure that your child is healthy when you go in for the vaccinations. And it, the CDC has a very well-defined set of criteria, you know, a temperature above this or certain symptoms or certain illnesses for, for when doctors should not vaccinate a child. But my experience is almost 100% that when a parent brings their child to the doctor's office for an already scheduled visit, let's say a child is scheduled to come in for – um, their their one year checkup and or their fourteen month checkup and get some vaccinations and mom baby wakes up and has a little bit of a fever and mom decides to keep the appointment anyway i 'm the only doctor I know in my practice that i 've been in or in the hospitals that i 've worked in that actually will send the mom home and say let 's not vaccinate today go home we'll we 'll do this appointment another day. But I do think that's really important, and it's important for parents to take the responsibility to make that choice because, as I'm saying, physicians will say, well, we've got you in the office. Let's just make it convenient, or maybe the parent won't come back, so let's just do it now. So making sure your child's completely well, no runny nose, no earache, um, nothing like that, diarrhea, nothing. And then I encourage parents, especially if they're worried, to schedule the vaccines early in the day, and just take the day off from work if they're working parents outside the home. Don't send the little one to school. Just keep them home. Keep an eye on them. That way, you know, you'll kind of be more at peace yourself, and then if anything does come up, you can take care of them. Um, I, I'm not so – a lot of parents ask me about, you know, should I take homeopathic? Should I take vitamin C? You can do any of those things. I'm not sure how much they change the likelihood of an adverse reaction if it's going to happen, but certainly vitamin C can help support and bolster the immune system. Where I draw the line is encouraging parents not to give any supplements or botanicals that really would have a big impact on the immune system because if you're going to give vaccinations, you want them to work. You don't want to give something that's going to interfere with them. So don't go and give a bunch of echinacea or a bunch of herbs or a bunch of supplements that might affect the efficacy of the vaccinations. But um, on the other hand, you had some ideas for natural immune support. So this is not on the day of vaccination or when a child is being vaccinated, if that's what the parent chooses. This is just ongoing ideas for natural immune support. And I love, this. I love this keep the tonsils. I swear there must be some bounty on tonsils. 
every other so. week. They want to take our tonsils out. And the tonsils are an important part of the immune system. They are. They're kind of our first gate right there back in our uh, our upper respiratory passages just before, just after the throat. So I, I think they're pretty important, too. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes kids drink so much juice and eat so much sugar and have so much soda and junk food that their immune systems are a wreck and they're constantly getting swollen tonsils and swollen adenoids because the body is inflamed and, and fighting things off all the time. And then parents really just get to a point where they do have to take them out. So preventing that from happening is critically important. You know, the immune system is really, it is the uh, system that keeps us alive, keeps us connected to our planet, keeps us separated where we're supposed to be separated, make sure what's supposed to get in and nourish us gets in and make sure what's supposed to stay out stays out. It's pretty important. Um, and really just a healthy lifestyle, a really healthy lifestyle with good food. It doesn't always have to be organic, but at least whole foods. Um, organic for the environmental working group, Dirty Dozen, um, but everything else, you know, fair game. And then meat and dairy should be organic just because they tend to, uh, meat and dairy tend to collect more of the environmental contaminants and the um, animal um, animal raising uh, or, uh, antibiotics and things like that that right. tend to store in the fat. Um, but good diet, adequate sleep, plenty of fun, keeping stress to a minimum, and making sure kids get outside and play. Let kids get dirty. We know full on from the hygiene hypothesis that kids need to get dirty to build their immune system. And we know that antimicrobial soaps, antimicrobial toothpaste, antimicrobial dishwashing detergent, all of these products, dampen the immune system and make kids more susceptible to resistant infections. So it's important to get those out, kind of go clean and green at home, nothing antimicrobial. And, you know, Dr. Rom, I have to say these are great recommendations for adults, too. I need more sleep, less stress, and I need to get outside and play. You need to get dirty. <laughs> get in the garden. Um, I also want to point out your books. Uh, both of them are just wonderful. Naturally Healthy Babies and Children and Vaccinations, A Thoughtful Parent's Guide. You also have a website, avivaram.com. Oh, that rhymes, avivaram.com. Uh, and I, But I wanted to make sure that we had time for questions because we've had a lot of questions that are coming in, and they're just fascinating. So let's uh, let's start, shall we, with some of the um, the questions that are coming through. Uh, the right. first one is the first one's interesting. Um, it's about uh, the HIV vaccine. Uh, there's been a lot of research ongoing to find cures and preventative steps. And how does the research take place? And do you know what's going on with the HIV vaccine? I don't know what's going on with the HIV vaccine, frankly. Um, my knowledge base is more vertical transmission prevention from mom to baby and um, response when somebody does get an inadvertent um, exposure. Um, but basically, vaccination research is really fascinating and it's complicated and it, it's a, um, a process that um, you have to spend a lot of time, you have to love spending a lot of time in the laboratory looking in microscopes and looking on petri dishes. And um, right now we don't have a vaccine that we can rely on for HIV. I am super cautious about um, testing anything right out of the gate. When I was at Yale Medical School, the then dean of the medical school had what he called the Chase Rule. His name was Herbert Chase, and he had the Chase Rule of three, which is wait three years until something's available on the market before you use it, because that's usually when you're going to start seeing the side effects and the adverse events. It means it's getting tested on the general population, but um, I tend to follow that rule with myself and my family and my patients. So at this point, you know, prevention is really key. Um, mothers who are pregnant getting appropriate medications while they're pregnant to prevent transmission to the baby. Women who are in labor, if they haven't been treated, getting appropriate treatment, use of condoms, things like that is, is really where we're at with it right now. This is a fascinating question, and I, and I, thank, I thank the uh, asker for such a thought-provoking idea. Uh, this gentleman works at a WIC, that's Women, Infants, and Children Clinic, and mm -hmm. is observing that a number of the children reporting to the office, there's an increased rate of autism, which we all know. Uh, many moms are blaming the vaccine. However, he has noticed that the moms he's interviewed all had an epidural during birth. Do you think there's a link between, like perhaps a three-way link, epidurals given during the uh, delivery process 
uh, and vaccines. That's interesting. I haven't heard anybody bring that up before. Um, the only um, effect that I know that the epidural can have is it can drop the mother's blood pressure, and as a result, it can drop the um, baby's blood pressure secondarily. I don't know that there's been data done on epidurals and autism. I mean, there are so many things that that could be a link, and that is certainly interesting. I'm going to actually you know, and that's probably know. why it's that's probably why it's so hard to get down to a causative factor is that maybe something like high levels of sugar, living in an industrialized city, epidural. Do you know what I mean? It's probably yeah. such a combination of factors that it's hard to pinpoint, and and it's been demonstrated that there are genetic links as well. Yeah, and I, there are many more mothers that get epidurals than children that get autism, for sure. Uh, here's a person who says their 12-year-old son has had all of his vaccines. He is mm -hmm. going into middle school, and he's required to have the Tdap, which is, I believe, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Uh, now that I now that I know more about vaccines, I'm thinking I don't want him to have this. It, what's the risk or downfall of not vaccinating when he's already been vaccinated? So the reason that Tdap is given at at that age is, as I mentioned before, is for the waning immunity. The actual risk of him having, and it's it's really for the pertussis part of it, because he's not likely to be exposed to diphtheria. The diphtheria should be lifelong immunity, or pretty long term at least, and the um, tetanus would be uh, a booster 10 years after his last vaccination. Um, but the real reason is to prevent him from being becoming a vector for pertussis, particularly for pregnant women and little children. So that really becomes more of a public health issue because by age 12, you're not likely to have a life-threatening case of pertussis. You're more likely going to have several months of a really annoying cough. Mm -hmm. um, this one is something I've wondered myself. Is it possible, I'm sure it would be more expensive and time-consuming, but is it, is it possible to do antibody titers prior to vaccination to make sure that you need the boosters? It is possible, and some families do choose to do that, but it's it's not cost-effective by any means. Mm -hmm. But I have done that for people. Um, for example, I've had a lot of people who have come from um, countries where they didn't know if they had been vaccinated as children because there weren't full-on vaccination practices in their country, and now they're adults here in our country getting ready to go to college and don't necessarily want to get everything. So for measles, mumps, and rubella, I've done titers on people. Um, for for uh, chicken pox, you can do a titer, but you can't do it for everything. Uh, I don't know that you could do a titer for all of the illnesses, so it would only be applicable to some of them. Mm -hmm. okay. And you um, can even do a titer on your kids before you vaccinate. And, you know, I don't know that any physician would really do it, and again, it's not cost-effective, but I have known families who deferred vaccinations for several years and then did titers on a few of them just to see if their kid was immune before they went ahead and vaccinated. Um, here's a good question. You know, so many of the vaccines are two and three uh, combined into a single injection, like the Tdap and that sort of thing. Um, is it possible? What if you just want one part of it, but you don't want the other two parts? Are they available as single vaccines? Yes, some of them are. Uh, so you can get, for example, just a tetanus, or you can get just a tetanus diphtheria. You can get just rubella. Uh, you can. So there are a number of them that are available as single vaccines that you can get. Um, some of the ones that are available just as single vaccines do actually still have the thimerosal in them, but it's been taken out of most of the vaccinations at this point. And you, you have to um, let your doctor know way ahead of time that you want it because they might have to special order it and you might have to pay for a vial of it because they might not have any other use for it. So you may have to special special have it special ordered for you to get it separate. But I have done that for people. Um, is Here's a good question. Is the immune system itself healthier if one just takes care of the body and uses natural means like healthy diets, exercise, et cetera, versus kids who receive the vaccines? Whose immune system is healthier? Well, I don't think either one's immune system is necessarily healthier, or I don't think that vaccinations inherently diminish the immune system. Um, I think it's just more individual person-to-person person than whether people were vaccinated or not. 
really, it, once you've been vaccinated, you've just sort of had the pump primed a little bit, um, but that may happen to you if you're not vaccinated also, if you've just been exposed to something. So I don't, I don't think it's a, a, a comparison that you could have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, another question wants to know if you would be in support of a study that compared the overall health of children who are vaccinated versus those who are not vaccinated. And then they're mentioning something from Dr. Einstein's practice of 40,000 children. I am not uh, familiar with that. Is that something you're familiar with? It might be Dr. Eisenberg from Chicago, oh. but um, there has never been a study looking at the health of vaccinated compared to unvaccinated children. And a lot of us would love to see that done, but um, there's medical ethics that come into play with doing that study formally because the belief is that all children should be vaccinated and therefore by not vaccinating a cohort in order to do that study, um, you would be basically depriving them of medical care that they should have. So that's not considered medically ethical. Although I do suspect that there would be a lot of parents that would volunteer their children to be part of that study just because so many people want, that, want to see that study done. Well, and the other thing is there might be a selection bias because parents who choose not to vaccinate may have very strong beliefs about health and diet and would perhaps their children would be exposed to perhaps less sugar or, or maybe there would be um, you know more whole grains. It's hard to project, but quite often the people that are most vigilant about vaccines are vigilant about other areas of health as well. Right. Well, they're going to be a healthier population in general. This is not a combination. This is rarely a conversation that's happening in low-income communities, and it's rarely a conversation that's happening in developing countries. Um, this is a conversation that's largely happening amongst middle and upper middle class and wealthier socioeconomic strata in, in this country, not even really that much middle class. It's really a higher socioeconomic strata that's considering this, and so it is a population that is inherently healthier, has a better diet, has less social stress, has better living conditions. Um, you know, if you just look at, for example, the population of children in Hartford, Connecticut, 40% of those kids have asthma. 40% of all kids in one city have asthma, but if you also look at the socioeconomic strata of that city, all those kids, most of those kids are going to fall below the poverty line. So, it's not a study that is going to be universally applicable no matter what. Uh, here's a really interesting story, uh, st These are idea. These good questions, you guys. These are, aren't they actually? Well, good you know, questions. only the smartest attend the webinars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but here's an interesting one. And, and you know, I'm, no, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of epigenetics, about how things that happen in one generation can actually change the genetic expression in our offspring and on our offspring's offspring. I mean, some of the factors... They're finding now in research for multiple sclerosis, for example, were stressors that were experienced by great-grandparents and grandparents that may have set the stage, genetically speaking, to make offspring more susceptible to multiple sclerosis. So there's lots of really interesting work being done around this. Yeah. Uh, this gentleman is asking, are there any studies or do you have any ideas about the long-term effects of vaccines, not, uh, for example, in future generations, the DNA replication in future generations, or just in the, at the end of our own lifespan. So effects of vaccines in people that are 90 years old, or effects of vaccines in children two or three generations away. Well, um, we're just starting to see the vaccine. We're just starting to see three generations away right now from when vaccines were really started in mass in this country. And there are some people that are saying that what we're seeing in the kids, for example, with the high rate of autism now, actually has very little to do with what kids are being exposed to right now. But it may actually be exactly what you're saying. It may actually be influences in, you know, our parents' generation that then influenced our generation if we're in our 30s and 40s and, or, you know, 50s on this conversation um, that have now influenced our children's children um, and that may be actually that's really what we're seeing. There, to my knowledge, there has not been any data collection or any kind of scientific analysis of this, and I think it would be really hard to do because it's not like there's somewhere that the vaccine goes in your body and directly affects your genes. Um, it doesn't quite work that way. So it's not like you can um, look at the histones or you can't look at the genetics or you can't look at the upstream epigenetics and say, 
oh, here's a little bit of that um, uh, measles fragment or here's a little bit of that aluminum. Uh, to some extent, that may be possible in a very limited way, but you wouldn't necessarily be able to tie it back to the vaccination. So that data is not there, but it's definitely something we need to be thinking about. Um, a, a huge area of interest for me in my current um, work is actually preconception care and looking at the Im influences that pregnant mothers and actually pregnant fathers, like a big study just came out recently showing that um, paternal age at the time of conception was correlated with higher rates of autism in kids. It was a study in, in the UK, I think. Um, so there are tons of factors that can contribute. and. If we can start by helping pregnant women understand this before they even get pregnant, we would do a ton to help prevent illnesses in our kids. We definitely know that uh, lower maternal folate is not only associated with um, neural tube defects, but we now know that lower maternal folate may in influence autism rate. Uh, we know that moms who have depression, whether or not they're taking antidepressant medications, have a higher risk of depression in their kids and behavioral problems. We know that women who are um, uh, diabetic during pregnancy are more likely, or overweight, or have high insulin during pregnancy, are more likely to have kids that develop these diseases when they're older. So we have to look at all of these factors many generations back at this point. And, you know, the sad thing is, at least a few years ago when I was doing some research for an article I was writing, 50% uh, of the pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. Oh, yeah, they still are. And 50%. And that statistic shocked me. Um, I would have said maybe, you know, maybe 30% are unplanned. But, no, a full 50%. So every other child that's born, uh, the, the mother and father were not necessarily thinking about having a child, and it's very hard to set yourself up for a healthy pregnancy if you don't get started before you become pregnant. It is, and it's interesting because, you know, in my mind, I remember first hearing that statistic, and I had, you know, drunken teenagers in my mind, like all these kids <laughs> are just getting pregnant. But it's actually that number is fairly equally distributed in the teenage population and women in their 40s. And so you think about this, you have women in their 40s who are not taking folate anymore because they don't think they're going to get pregnant, and their partners are older, and so you have more factors that conspire to potentially lead to some of these problems that we're talking about in kids. Excellent. Uh, here's a question about um, uh, from a person who did not. They chose not to vaccinate their three-month-old son for hepatitis B, but she works in a hospital laboratory and understands that she herself is at greater risk of contracting hepatitis B. Should she be concerned about bringing this uh, infection home to her son, somehow infecting her son? You know, that's a complicated um, question, and I struggled that I struggled with that when I was in medical school. I got vaccinated for hepatitis B just because it's so prevalent and so easily transmissible. And sometimes I was in an operation or in a patient's room, and there was blood on the floors, and then I would have blood on my shoes and forget to take my shoes off when I came in the house at home. You know, just inadvertently would walk in, and so that concern certainly crossed my mind. And it's a legitimate concern particularly with certain infections, hepatitis B being one of those, just because it does live on surfaces for a long time. Realistically, for a child to get exposed to it and then contract it, there would have to be some way that it would get into the child's mouth or into the child's bloodstream. So the chances are still extremely low, but they're not zero. My daughter-in-law, you know, um, just for whoever asked this question, my daughter-in-law is a pediatrician, and she has a baby who I delivered at home, is breastfed, you know, raising the baby completely naturally. But she decided to vaccinate my granddaughter for a lot of these illnesses because she was in the hospital working all the time and regularly getting exposed to things. So she felt that the risk to Ari was actually more likely um, from exposure which I didn't actually 100% agree with, but it's, you know, that comes down to a very individualized decision. And what I always kind of bottom line ask parents to do when they're making a decision like this is just kind of get really quiet with yourself and sort of kind of decide what you can live with. You know, what worries you more? Um, the risk of hepatitis B vaccinations, there's a little bit of risk. Um, it's more musculoskeletal. Uh, when older women get the hepatitis B vaccine, you know, women in their 20s and older, um, I should say, 
Um, they tend do have some more joint complaints that, that may last even up to a year. But it's a f relatively low-risk vaccine. It's a pretty horrible illness. But, again, the chance of a baby getting it just from a mom working in a laboratory is, is, is still small. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the HPV vaccine. Have you seen any adverse reactions to the HPV vaccine, and is it something that you advocate, or do you give that? I will tell you, just as an aside, I wrote my book before I applied to medical school. And when I applied to medical school, I had several physician colleagues say, Aviva, don't put that you wrote that book onto your <laughs> onto your CV when you were onto your application because <laughs> you're going to get in trouble. So here's one of those questions. I have not seen adverse effects of the HPV vaccine. It is one of the few vaccines that I actually do not encourage parents to get. You know, the other vaccines all have kind of a meaningful talk, and I'll still have a very meaningful talk with my patients about the HPV vaccine. Um, but it does concern me. Um, I think that we can do just as well for our daughters by teaching them how to have safe sex and um, encouraging them to get regular pap smears. The, the pap smear regulations, the, uh, the pap smear um, recommendations, for example, have just gone down. They used to be every year, then they went down to every three years. Now they're, if you're healthy, every three to five years, depending on your age group. And the reason for this is that cervical cancer is an extremely slow-growing cancer that is highly treatable. And so if young women are – and you don't even have to start treating it. Uh, you don't even have to start testing for it until um, girls are 21 because by between, the eight, between teenage years and age 21, the body almost 100% will clear it. So we don't even test for it anymore in, under age 21. Um, so – my advocacy around the HPV vaccine is really to encourage parents to mothers to be able to have good conversations with their daughters about sex, to encourage women to get their pap smears on in a schedule that's appropriate for their risk factors. Um, and really, the places where women are largely developing cervical cancer that's caught too late are in developing countries where the HPV vaccine is absolutely not available and cost prohibitive. There have been a number of cases of something called Guillain-Barre syndrome from the HPP, HPV vaccine, and I, I'm just personally not entirely satisfied with its safety at this point versus the the need for it. I that remember the Guillain-Barre. That's just my very that's yeah. my very opinionated opinion about it. Well, I appreciate that, uh, but I remember the Guillain-Barre syndrome occurring after the swine flu vaccinations. Remember when they had those. Um, Back in the was that the 70s? Yeah, back in the Many 70s. Many years ago, yeah. uh, that it, that was in some people quite serious. It's a it can be as much as a whole body paralysis for a period of time. Yeah, it can even be fatal. Um, yeah. And it's it's rare. I don't know the numbers offhand. I apologize for the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome after mm -hmm. HPV, and it can happen after several of the vaccinations. Um, but again, it it comes down to me. It comes down to a sort of risk-benefit ratio for me, and in that case, we have other ways to prevent and detect HPV um, than just the vaccination. So I don't consider it at this point, in my opinion, a necessary harm to give to our kids. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question about and, the, sorry, uh, and not just our daughters, but our sons as well, because our sons. Can well, be have you seen children. the marketing campaigns to get the oh, boys vaccinated yes. now for HPV? I my oh, yeah. I almost my draw my jaw dropped when I saw that in a recent magazine. Oh, I tell you, I, I get my medical journals and I'm just shocked. I mean, 50% of the pages are advertisements. All right, uh, question about hepatitis B. If a person wants to know, is sex the only way to get hepatitis B virus? And I would say no. Would you care to expound on how you can get the hepatitis B virus? Yeah, you can get hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is not that difficult to contract, actually, because it lives on surfaces for a long time. And you can get it from a variety of body fluids, uh, including feces, uh, saliva, and uh, most commonly blood. But healthcare workers who are um, changing bedding um, uh, could accidentally get stuck by a needle. Any of these ways can get it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Even um, All right. uh, tattoos. People have gotten it from sharing toothbrushes. People have gotten it from sharing razor blades. 
So certainly sex is one way to get hepatitis B, but it's, it is one there's way. other ways. Yeah. Correct. Right. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, there's this is something that's news to me, but I'm perhaps you're more familiar. There's a new influenza vaccine, flu block, that contains... Yes, I just heard of this that, myself. It's that some contains, kind of like recombinant something. Yeah, genetically modified proteins from three different flu strains. Yes. Two of the study participants just died. Yes. How do you feel about genetically modified proteins and vaccines? Well, there are a number of genetically modified antibodies and and, and medications that are valuable and life-saving. I think the question is twofold here. One, um, do we need this flu vaccine for everybody? And what's wrong with the old one that we need this new one? If they were telling us that there's no problem with the old one, why, why this new one? And kind of hearkening back to the chase rule of three, there needs to be a lot more study on this flu vaccine. It's been hastily produced after last year's concern about the flu and the lack of efficacy of the flu virus and so many people who were declining the flu virus, uh, flu vaccine um, because they were concerned about the vaccination and the thimerosal. Basically, the reason this one was produced is that it's able to be produced entirely preservative-free. And so that was sort of the selling point of it. I would be hesitant to get it. I, I, at this point, I wouldn't even give it to a patient if they asked for it. I would say, no, I'm not comfortable with it yet. It needs to be better studied. Um, so if that tells you anything, I would encourage my patient, if they wanted to be flu vaccinated, to get either the nasal live mist or the traditional flu vaccine. You know, um, I know that many of our attendees, uh, perhaps because of their interest in this topic in the first place, um, have a great deal of concern about genetically modified foods, crops, mm -hmm. et cetera, that are being introduced. And I certainly understand that. And But I also believe that um, in medicine, for example, there are ways where we use E. coli to make human insulin that was developed by Lilly so that people would stop, so people with diabetes that required insulin would stop having reactions to the beef and the pork insulin that right. was previously being used uh, as one example versus these Frankenstein things that seem to be um, created where they're taking a little piece of this and a little piece of that uh, to create entirely new substances that have never been on the planet before. And that, to me, even as someone who's worked in the healthcare field, is alarming. It feels like our, our ability to do things is running very far ahead of our wisdom in making the decision of whether we should or should not do them. I agree. I agree with you. And even genetically modified foods, I mean, we just don't know. And it's concerning. It's concerning. I think, we, you know, I try not to be overly romantic and sort of hearkening back to nature, and I certainly don't hearken back to better times. I mean, every generation has had its problems, and I'm glad I have heat and don't live on the Pioneer, in the pioneer times, and I'm glad I have antibiotic access when I need it, and I'm glad I have these things. But um, we do heavily over medicalize and overly um, technologize our lives, and we're not necessarily getting any benefit. I mean, we're the country that spends more on healthcare and food than any other in the world, and we're the sickest of all the developing, and a lot of the um, all of the develop, Western developed countries and a lot of the developing countries on so many, basically on all our major health parameters from diabetes to obesity to heart disease to maternal and infant mortality statistics. So I think listening to nature's wisdom, trusting our instincts, making intelligent decisions, not, not just being knee-jerk against every technological intervention or every medication or every medical intervention, sometimes they are really needed, but um, definitely thinking twice and then twice again is important. Mm -hmm. Well, perfect note upon which to end this conversation. Thanks for having Thank me you. and inviting me to talk about this important and I know confusing and controversial topic. Well, um, I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day to share this with us. I would encourage everyone out there to um, to go to avivaram.com and to find out more information on your books. Um, I can't thank you enough for helping us better understand the pros and the cons and for having such a um, for such a common sense voice in this sometimes strident discussion. Thank you. Thank My you. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Right, Let's do this again. Much. Let's do this again sometime. Let's do. Let's talk All right. about kids and antibiotics. That's a good one. Too. Absolutely. That's a great topic. <laughs> Thank it. you so much. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. 
Uh, folks, I want to make sure that you are aware on May 30th we have um, an expert all the way from Iceland, and I'm going to try to say this. Her name is Perla Björk Eil's daughter, who is going to be attending via doing a presentation, a webinar on using a special kind of Icelandic Angelica Archangelica that's been clinically studied for incontinence and other embarrassing bladder issues, including um, overactive bladder with a, with a lot of nervous irritation of the bladder that causes individuals who suffer from that to feel that they have to urinate constantly. Uh, a very important herbal breakthrough. Uh, the reason that we have this nature picture here is that, that Dr. Um, Eo's daughter is actually standing in a field of uh, Angelica Archangelica uh, in that, uh, with the beautiful pristine waters of Iceland behind her. If you uh, are interested in this topic, please register at terrytalksnutrition.com backslash webinars. Uh, we've had many questions, by the way, in the uh, chat box and in the Q&A box about getting copies of this presentation. I know some of you were registered, uh, may have registered after the point in which those presentations were sent out. We will make sure that we send out another handout with all the information on this. And uh, we've also had questions about whether this webinar was recorded. Yes, it was. Uh, you can go back onto the Terry Talks Nutrition dot com website and listen to an archive version of this. So if you'd like to listen again, or you have friends to whom you would like to recommend this webinar, uh, we invite you to send them our way. So thank you so much for your time in attending this educational webinar. For more information, uh, please visit us at terrytalksnutrition.com. You can sign up for a free weekly newsletter, and I promise that we treat your email address uh, very carefully. It is never sold or shared with others. You can listen to recordings of past seminars, and there's even a place where you can ask your own questions. You can find us on Facebook or follow Terry Lemerand, uh, who is the uh, owner of Terry Talks Nutrition, at twitter.com backslash Terry Limeron for your daily dose of natural medicine information and motivational thoughts. So thank you again, all of you, and we hope to see you again at one of our upcoming educational webinars. And until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.